is Street Culture, the Real Sellout of Black Culture. In this episode, I am joined by Kofa of the Growth Talk podcast as we break down how toxic street culture is at a root of many challenges the Black community face today. It's time to ask, can we really move forward as a culture if we keep glorifying what's holding us back? Join us as we challenge the norms and explore while breaking away from street culture may be the key to progress. All right, let's get into this episode. All right, so this episode is about the uh, sellouts of the culture, right? So yeah. before we start, I want to have like a list of people that we will consider sellout. So I know who could we dis- discuss, right? Because uh, I don't know, people people really did enjoy the last uh, episode about the sellouts. So I had a good, you know, that was a good turnout. And yeah. I think that uh, this is another conversation we could piggyback on to <clears throat> keep that momentum going. So like when you say the sellouts of the culture, who are you referring to? Um. You know me, I'm just making more blanket statements. You know, I'm, I'm really like, we've talked about it before, but over the last probably like two weeks, I've really, really grown tired of the street culture. Okay. Like yeah. the general street culture, we've projected it as, oh, we influence the world. And when I'm talking street culture, I'm talking about everything from our dancing to the music to Mm -hmm. to all that and it's like oh we influenced the world salute you for the cup appreciate that um (laughs) but then we don't want to have the influence on the world when it's some negative stuff that goes right along with what we're doing right the the music spills over into the streets like we'll look at a young Dolph trial Mm -hmm. so allegedly yo got his brother said he was going to pay these guys a million dollars to off young Dolph or said, or he put the a million dollars up, which the dude was supposed to get X amount of thousand of whoever pulled the trigger. Cause you know, it was a couple of guys or whatever, yeah. for whatever reason. And he said he only seen 800 of that money. 800 grand. No, $800. He only got paid $800 from this dude. I take that back. So again, like like they said, you got one millionaire paying somebody to offer another millionaire. I think he offered them like, it was at least five five figures. So maybe 10 bands, something like that. But he only saw 800. Said he ain't met, the dude said he didn't meet Dolph a day in his life. And the only reason he did it because he needed some money because he needed to get some presents for his daughter because her birthday was coming up. Hey, yeah, eight hundred dollars, bro, for some yeah. gifts for his daughter for, and his brother isn't here no more. Now we got to also look at the landscape of the type of music that Dolph put out. Mm-hmm. Not saying this man deserved to be dead behind, you know, certain music or recordings or whatever, but when that image is portrayed. Yeah. And, you know, uh, a kind of a a lesser known rapper, um, Adobe. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I think I mentioned him. Yeah, you mentioned him. On, on my live before, but he's from Montgomery, Alabama, where I'm from. And he was signed to Tip label. Tip kept, uh, T.I. kept warning mm-hmm. him about coming home. He comes home. What happens? He gets murked. He gets murked by a dude just straight up jealous. And the dude, Sorry. like, was standing next to this man in his first like video that blew up. Damn. Somebody he knew. I don't know how tight they were, whatever, but bro's not here no more. But we keep celebrating this street culture, like the about um takeoffs murder, you know, or you know, accidental killing, depending yeah. on who you ask. <clears throat> All that type of stuff, man. So it's just it's sad this is where we are as a people but you know in conjunction with you and drew bro like see the lord sucker was right she warned she warned about it i don't think she probably foresaw it getting this bad she just didn't like what was going on at the time um which i get but like i said having come from that era it's for me it's always difficult to be like yeah yeah we're wrong we're wrong we're wrong when we can actually look at our parents' generation 
for having low key kind of kicked it off mm -hmm. with the black exploitation films. Yeah. Like I hear, I, I hate hearing from older people. Like I know you don't like the word either, and I promise you, bro, I've tried. But the N word, yeah. but adjusting adjusting that or stepping off of it sometimes, and hearing old people be like, "Man, you know, we didn't say that word. We called each other brother and sister." No, the fuck you didn't, bitch. I seen Dolomite. <laughs> like you're not gonna sit up here and fucking lie to me. Like I seen Superfly. Mm -hmm. I seen the Mac. Like there's a. God almighty, I forgot what, um, it's a website that had like a list of all the black exploitation film soundtracks or songs from soundtracks back then. And it wasn't just the popular ones that I just mentioned, like Superfly, <clears throat> The Mac, or um, uh, Dolomite. Dolomite. It's, bro, it's so many black exploitation films out there. Like, that shit blew my mind when I found that website. I just kept scrolling and scrolling. Because, you know, back then we didn't, of course, just like now, it, it pretty much like finding that website let me know there that was their version of Tubi back then. Mm -mm. It was so many independent films, bro. Like, so many. I got to try to find that link and send it to you, dog. It was, it was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous number. It's like cutting on Tubi right now and just letting hood movies play all day. You know, that shit can go on for a couple of weeks because yeah. everybody done put out some type of independent film, good, bad, or indifferent. Just a numerical number of this is black life. This is the hood. Just mm -hmm. like we call it the hood. What did our elders call it? We was growing up in the ghetto. Yep. Like We haven't come Ain't that far, change. bro. No. It, it, and it's frustrating to be like, oh, man, we came for so far because, you know, you had to worry about, you know, this and that and racism and everything. But we still got to worry about now, that now. But they damn we damn near beating them to the punch, man. Yeah. Like I said, we on autopilot. <clears throat> we on autopilot. That's all. I mean, we don't need a Puff to be a handler. We don't need a Suge Knight to be a gangster. You know what I'm saying? Like, a, <clears throat> I know they say some of the stories about Puff. I mean, there's some stories about Suge, too. Yeah. You know, Suge coming from gang culture, I don't know if it's true or not. I can't confirm it or not, but, you know, Suge said, well, not he said, but people said about Suge, for him to, you know, assert his dominance, he make the dude suck his dick. And they'll do yeah. it because they're scared of Suge. So it was like, it's not too far-fetched. And now you get you come up with some industry and it's not nothing for Suge to be like, yeah, he sucked my dick. You know what I'm saying? That make you look bad. What you gonna do? You gonna fight sugar over it? So, and this part that goes to the street culture too, bro. Yeah, the dominant. I talked to some cats that were um, they used to work in prisons or whatever, like the guards and stuff like that. And he would say, "Man, it'll be some of the most hardcore looking gangsters you wouldn't think. They'll come up to him and be like, hey, officer, such and such. You see that dude over there on the fence?'" I had him squealing like a pig last night. Like, mm. what the fuck? And it's so mm. normalized, bro. That's why I'm so sick of street culture, bro. Because we do not tell the truth about it. We love to, we love to glorify it. Um, again, that's why I stayed on that. That that was the first thing I went to when you asked me who were the sellouts. It's not just who, but the what, the actions that go behind selling out. Yeah. A lot of this murder, um, the drug use, hell, child abandonment. It's a lot of sellout, goofy-ass behavior that we love in our community. Mm -hmm. Until it's that one for whatever reason that we want to say, oh, no, enough is enough, and we're not going to do this anymore. Two weeks later, we right back at it. Regular schedule programming. Program. <laughs> I got your hoodie right there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, you got it? Oh, damn, yeah, man, I got to get it before I leave. Yeah, when you leaving? Uh, shit, I really don't know. It's supposed to be sometime next week. They haven't given me a word. I actually got to check some emails when, when we wrap uh, up. I mean, we, I mean, we find some time to I uh, Uber somewhere to meet up with you, and I give it to you. Some yeah, we'll wrap it up this weekend yeah. or something. Yeah, but yeah, man. Who, who would you consider to be? Do you have any names or <sighs> behaviors or thought processes? Um, 
for sale. I mean, street culture was like king. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's that 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 kind of uh snowball into other things, you know what I'm saying? So I think street culture is the sellout, the big sellout, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like you said, Young Dolph getting killed for $800 and, you know, ooh, excuse me, how we value black men life for $800. Like, at the end of the day, you know, Young Dolph was a great commodity in hip-hop, but he's also still a man. A black man, a father, a, a son, father, a husband, yeah, all that, a brother, yeah. a friend, and all that for eight hundred dollars. Like I said, you you could literally work at Walmart for two weeks and make more than eight hundred dollars. Your check, take home check, would be more than eight hundred dollars at Walmart. And instead of you going to Walmart <laughs> and get a discount to get some gifts for your daughter, you're going to kill Young Dolph. Then that. Then that goes to the lazy mindset. Then that goes to the victimhood mindset. Dude, I got to do for my daughter. Yeah. I'm not sure how old his daughter was, but if you would have took your daughter to fucking Chuck E. Cheese, she would have had a great time. For like Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. Like, you spending time Some with Someone bringing back the little playpen area. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Bro, you know it's another one that I think is a, is a sellout culture? And this is me as a spiritual and religious person. Religion, yeah. The the, ap the application of the religion, I say. The way yep. the way it's used, the way it's marketed, specifically Christianity. Sorry for my Christian people out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are still afraid of Islam. I don't. I don't want to, you know, push religion on any of the viewers. But I think a lot of people are still afraid of Islam. Um, I think that they think that, you know, a lot of Muslim men beat our women to keep them in line and, and things like that. But you hear so many of these stories coming out of the Christian church all the time. And it's still like. Yeah. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. So I think yeah. other people are seeing it, too. I don't think it's enough to where it's going to have an impact. Um, anytime soon, unfortunately. I think it's gonna it's about to be a uh, separation, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, other cultures do it. I think it's time for us to lock in and separate. I mean, you know, there's different degrees of, I guess, Asian people. Definitely, like say the migrants, they try to separate themselves. The hardworking migrants from the, the 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 street gangs, they trying to separate. They just they want to separate yeah. themselves. Um, you know, a trailer park trash white person compared to a suburban soccer mom. You know, they're trying to separate. Yeah. People separate themselves. And I think it's time for us to separate ourselves. We can't constantly put comparison to everything we see to say that it's going to be us. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I really realized that when I seen that George Floyd and it was like, I seen articles, people saying, oh, this that's going to be me. That could have been me. I'm like, Nah, that couldn't have been me. I'm not going to the stores with fake twenty dollar bills. You know what I'm saying? I never had fit and all, so yeah. that's not going to be me. So why am I putting myself in that same situation when I never been in that same situation? Yeah, I have to start separating myself. I think people are really starting to do that because it's it's not everybody. Right, before we continue with the content, man, make sure you guys hit the like button and follow Broken Traditions wherever you find this content at. Also, I want to give a special shout out to the Broken Tradition channel members, the, the Tradition Breakers. We got some new people who joined the Tradition Breakers. Uh, appreciate you guys for joining, helping me out, helping keep the lights on for Broken Traditions. We're going to have an exclusive uh, podcast recording, right? So what we do here is we have online podcast recordings. We're going to have a special guest on so you guys get to see the behind the scenes and see you know we have these great conversations with other content creators and you guys also have input in the comments that's for channel members only so if you guys want to join the tradition breakers hit the link in the show notes and after that you could become a channel member and get the exclusive content when we have other people come on all right let's continue on with this episode now i think that was the ploy we picked up because they looked at us all the same then we should have looked at all of us the same mm -hmm. and we can't keep moving like that bro 
it is causing too much of a detriment across the board where you have people that are talented are smart are intelligent but they're latching on to this the struggle part of the culture like oh yeah. you ain't black if you ain't never went through nothing yeah but we'll but we'll turn around and celebrate lebron james and nepotism but if you get your like if you get your son on at a job mm -hmm. oh he think you better than somebody yep if you but hey you i'm not with that uh you know i'm not you know young cats like you were talking about with uh with your son he ain't with all that extra rah rah shit a lot of these young cats is on he want to go to work make his little bread and stay out of the way yeah but how many of them cats probably giving them the side out that he work with that might be in the same age group or or even a little bit older what you mean mm -hmm. you don't want to come kick it with us after work oh this nigga lame yep this that you know what i'm saying so i i totally agree with you it's time for a big separation because the the way the street culture has become the culture and is black culture until we don't want it to be but then because i was when we have somebody street, online we have street <clears> culture <throat> it's like a whole triangle right so <clears throat> well can we consider hip-hop culture a top of street culture because a lot of times i guess i guess it's intertwined like it's like parents like mother and father street culture mm -hmm. hip-hop culture then after that you got sub genres of you know drug culture then you got another sub genre of whole culture. culture huh I would say I would say street culture is the is the parent. Street culture, so hip hop is not part of it, even though I guess hip hop fall hip hop is the street culture is the catalyst. Hip hop, I would say, is the conduit. It's the one okay. that pushes it out. Like, okay, okay. Street culture started it. Hip hop floods it all out because everything you just mentioned, drug use, street culture, hip hop. Put well, I guess, but, yeah, street culture, hip hop, whole culture, sexuality. Because guess what, street culture gonna lead to jail. Yeah, you only around one. You know what I'm saying? Then that dude comes home, or maybe he went in when he was too young. He didn't even have a chance to hit puberty yet. He already been in and out, just around a bunch of other males. Mm -hmm. But it comes in and it starts permeating the rest of the culture and then we accept it and now you get to that next tier where's the church that accepts it then yeah. if pastor say it's okay then it must be okay because the lord said it's okay now we okay with it in our home because we got to worship jesus i'm just going with the general statements you know general yeah. religion then those become the values where people yeah, don't even think anything is wrong. It's fuck you, because I see and I see it in my parents too. Like something crazy happened in the family, and they be like, "Oh, we just gonna pray for him." But then we watch something on the news, and somebody on the news does something just as crazy as somebody in our own family did, and be like, "Oh, that's a shame." I don't know what's wrong with these people. It's Damn. like we can't connect it when it's in our own home, and it's in our own culture sometimes. But we'll watch it on the news and be like, oh man, that's wild. Like Drew was just mm -hmm. talking about, oh, they're they're wild out there on the West Coast. That's crazy. But how much crazy shit we know was going on in the 80s and 90s in New York. And then I mean, us being down here in the South, we was just totally overlooked. But I could tell you stories for days. Yeah. Can't it became imagine. the culture. It became a culture. I had a back and forth with a brother. I was mentioning something about street culture and our worship, but I think it was when I had posted something about Trump. I was like, man, I think I decided to go ahead and vote for Trump because we love street culture so much. We love a gangster. We love a felon. So why not vote for one? And then somebody was like, well, that street culture isn't black culture. But I beg to differ mm -hmm. because that's what it's become. Because if you're not a part of it, if you don't, if you're not at least okay with it, then you ain't black. Yeah, you can't call it out. I mean, I, I, I had a video, right, or episode, I should say, where I talked about, um, I guess, the difference of attention for the Fortson brothers, Andre Fortson and Roger Fortson. And somebody in my comments was like, ain't no such thing as black and black crime. 
you just saying white talking points. you just trying to be the white man. Listen, I'm like, I'm a black man talking about black people getting killed 22 times a day, according to the CDC. And your response is, there's no such thing as black or black crime. I'm just doing black. I'm just doing white talking points. Why does a white person need to talk about black on black crime? This is our this is our thing to fix, and we gotta we gotta we gotta put a a, a stop to it. Let's talk about it. Let's address it, and let's shun the people who are doing this. But instead, you'd rather call me a sellout for doing that. I like okay, cool. Then he just unsubscribed. I mean, it is what yeah. it is. But like. That's crazy that that's his first defense. Just to keep that, like you said, the culture going. That's yeah. what he wanted to do. Makes no sense, bro. Dude, that's where that's where we at, bro. And yeah. it is it, it doesn't make any sense, but it's so it's become acceptable. Mm-hmm. Like how it's it's easier to call you a sellout than to correct. You know why I'm not gonna correct this other black man? Cause he might shoot me, so it's easier yeah. for me to call you a sellout. Mm-hmm. That's simple. It, it looks like we're all together and we're all throwing up a fist and all that. Like, bro, I, I'm telling you, I struggle with my thumbnail. It's so many pictures and stuff <laughs> that I wanted to put together. I struggle with it, but I think I'm gonna run with what Drew uh, was talking about. But um, it looks cool when we're all together. We're all throwing up a fist and we all don't like Republicans and everything else under the sun. Everything mm-hmm. makes sense when we're all together. And then when we do all this infighting and harming each other, we find a way to justify it. Well, he was broke. He needed some money. My daughter's birthday was coming up. What did Biggie say? I was trying to sell a crack in front of the building to feed my daughter. But that crack you selling... Got somebody mom strung out. Got somebody dad strung out. Got somebody breaking he, in the cars, going through ashtrays, looking for change. Remember, um, give me the loot? Yeah. I wouldn't I, give I, a fuck if you're pregnant. Give me the baby ring and the number one mom pendant. <laughs> and Puffy at the time had the presence of mind to reverse the pregnant part. <laughs> Remember, it was, <laughs> I wouldn't give a fuck if you're... <laughs> yeah. He was like, man, you robbing some... But again, that's the street street culture because we've seen mm-hmm. actual news articles. It's not just a song where this pregnant woman was robbed and pushed down and might have lost the baby. Um, I remember I'm, watching Fresh as a kid. I don't know if you remember that movie. Yeah. When he was when he was selling when he sold some uh, crack to the pregnant chick. Yeah, I remember that. How many stories have we heard about that in real life? Where the kids come out fucked up? Mm-hmm. Or or they or they just not not totally fucked up, just a little bit off might be the, you know, the one kid with a tick in your class, and then you talk to an older person or, you know, an older family member, something like, oh man, that's such and such baby, man. Yeah. Yeah. Shawta used to be on that, she used to be on that stuff. Fucking sad, yo. Street culture, bro. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah. But yeah. All right, y'all. I appreciate yeah, you. Man. Appreciate you having me on, bro. Y'all know what it is. You matter. You're not crazy. Make better choices. Peace. Peace. All right, y'all. Now, holla, man. Peace. Peace. Later. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode between myself and Kofa. Uh it's a great conversation. Actually, there's also a part two to this conversation. Whereas Kofa, myself, and Drew Titan. But we discussed what C. Dolores Tucker Wright about the state of hip hop and the impact that it has on our culture. I'm gonna give you guys a sneak peek of this episode. So For this sure. episode Shout is gonna be Titan. about um, what C. Dolores Tucker Wright, right? Um, mm-hmm. You good with that, Kofa? You 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 yep. um, familiar with C. Dolores Tucker? I am. Okay, and I know Drew, you, you familiar with C. Dolores Tucker. And I think yeah. Drew, you are uh, probably be the more of the expert because you were older at the time when C. Dolores Tucker was fighting this. How old would you go for, like, in 91? Like, what, 8, 9? No, I was, yeah, 19, 91? Yeah. I thought that's... C. Dolores Tucker, when was that? 90, yeah, 91, 92, I was, like, 10. 10? Okay, I was, like, yeah, like, 8 or 9. So, like, 
I didn't know what was, was going like, on until later on. Like 15, 15, 16. Yeah, so I think Drew might have a more of a uh, experience with C. C. Dolores Tucker than we would to know, you know, the background well, information have, in real time. Um, I have more of a, uh, like I lived in that era. Yeah. I was a teenager. Um, I was heavily into the, uh, I was into the culture and um, I was more on the uh, cusp of, uh, you know, leave us alone, let us do our thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I respected uh, what, what my parents were saying. And there was a difference because hip hop was going through a change at that point and there was a yeah. danger zone. And there was things that I did notice and I said, hmm, okay, I love my, I love the hip hop culture, what we created, but there's some things going on that I don't, you know, register with. So I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Can I so, point out uh, something real quick? Go, go ahead. Why Drew may have been on the fence and it's something he says all the time. And I don't even think he realizes he says it. What my parents, plural. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm yeah mm -hmm. yeah it has an That's impact right. bro it does. so being that does. being that youthful guy you can see it because i remember being 10 and 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 seeing like because you know mtv had blew up by then mm -hmm. yeah so when it was anything music news music related it would hit mtv bt may get it second um yeah. but we saw them steam rolling you know cds you know, Al Sharpton, C. Dolores Tucker, you know, other, what was it, uh, Calvin Butts, the mm -hmm. the pastor back then. Uh, we yeah. seen them protesting. So it felt yeah. like, it because I was just getting into hip hop at that time, roughly, um, or realizing what it was. Um, so it could feel like, so I understood it felt like an attack. But at the same time, when I finally heard the, the real version of Doggy Style, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of got what, <laughs> I kind of got what she was saying mm -hmm. but Dre was such a cold producer at, at 10, 11, 12 years old I'm like fuck that but See, looking I, back I, now I knew, better, I knew better than to play Onyx out loud in the house there you go I knew better what, what was their first album called? Back the Fuck Up? Back the Fuck Up it was Back, the, word, like, back <laughs> the Fuck Up Back the Fuck Up because before, before T. Dolores Tucker started having those conversations about all the stuff that's going on in hip hop, there was a conscious side of hip hop. There was a balance. But when yeah. she started having this, uh, I guess, disagreement or this griff about what's going on with hip hop, she was like, it was, you starting to see the shift. And the shift really started with yeah. gangster rap. Like you said, gangster rap from the West Coast, uh, that pussy rap or whatever called booty rap from Luke in the South. And... Yeah. Like you said, Onyx, that crazy street gutter rapping in, in the East Coast. And it started yeah. to be a shift. Like it was no more that conscious KRS one, that fun, slick Rick Lottie Dotty type rap. Like it started to shift I over to something different. It, yeah. Tribe. Tribe called Quest. Was, yeah. Like, like bro, if it wasn't for a tribe called Quest, I I wouldn't have outcast. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So to for that shift to happen so quickly because you got to really think that was in the span of three years where it really really happened that was doggy style was what 92 no 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 i think it's really started with nwa yeah, yeah okay I, nwa you could get an nwa and you could also get a krs1 and rock him so when i say the shift happened i mean like the overnight like NWA was the foundation. Like, I, I agree with that. And, and what a lot of people don't know, when NWA was out, as big as it was on MTV, BET, on the radio box, it didn't get a lot of play in the South. Why? Because we had the Ghetto Boys. Mm -hmm. So it was happening mm -hmm. at the same time. Like, a lot of people forget that. So when I say the shift happened... I'm saying about between 91, 94, because Death Row became a stamp. It wasn't just a group. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because Death Row gave you Dre, gave you Snoop, eventually gave you Pac, um, the Dog, dog Pound. Pound, Rage. Yeah, like, and remember, Death Row had, Death Row went mainstream. Death Row had the soundtrack to Above the Rim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Then we immediately had that beef almost with bad boy death row, East Coast, West Coast. So when I say that shift happened, it was kind of right, overnight. Give me, give, me the, uh, you, you, give, me, give me the year, Kofa, because what year you pick, I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to go backwards from the year. Okay, I say... So you're talking I'll about the source of war beef with Diddy and, um, and Shook. What yeah, year was so that? that? Was, was that what, 96? 95? Nah, that was, that was like... It was... I it might have been 90, like 93, right? 90, I want to say it was 95. It, because the I, reason why I, I say I got 95 you on the Google ready, ready to Die dropped in 94. And the reason why I remember that, because everybody was expecting Biggie to win the Source Awards for the album of the year, but it went to Outkast. And that's when Drake gave the, the South got something to say. Yeah. So that was roughly 94, 95. And... Uh, I remember Gip saying they was the South, they was just sitting there because East Coast was taking shots because it was in New York, but Death yep. Row was there and the West Coast was taking shots. And he was sitting there. He was like, man, you know, we got this great album and don't nobody give a fuck about us. So that, that had to be 95. Um, fast forward, I think that Source Award situation, that was like 97? Mm, 95. I think... It was ninety five. Yeah. Okay. It was ninety five. Yeah. All right. When 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 Snoop came out and he got booed. Yeah. With Dre, yeah. that was that was ninety five. Yeah. All right, and that was when Shug came out and said, "If you don't want your, your producer <laughs> dancing all in the video." <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> yeah. I said, "Oh that man, was- I knew then." I said, "This about to get ugly, man. This about to get ugly." And then you know, Snoop did the New York song, and then. The cats out of Queensbridge did the LA song, and I said, "Oh boy, oh boy, okay, yeah. it's out of control." And then mm-hmm. Tupac and Biggie, that was the the mid to late '90s, and it just got crazy. But um, working backwards, we talked about a, a conscious rap that was the late '80s, the mid to late '80s. Um, Karis won after Scott LaRock was murdered. I remember that made the mm-hmm. news out here. Uh, Scott was murdered, and then you know he just did a 180, and he, um, by any means necessary, criminal minded. Well, that was after criminal minded. He did any means. His next album was uh, Edu. No, no, Edutainment was the third album. By any means necessary, I think that was the other. I forget the order, but um, he started to educate uh, people in the hip hop industry, and yeah. then what happened was NWA came out, and they were put on the stool and that was a contradiction to what we were trying to do here for people that don't know the term hip hop is a de- there's a definition to it do y'all know what the definition is it was like an acronym or something uh, or? yeah no it's not an acronym um hip hop as defined um the term hip um you ever heard the phrase i'm hip to your game plan I'm hip to yeah. that game plan. That means you're aware. Okay, I see what you're doing. And I'm going to move accordingly for my best interest. That's what hip means. Hop is movement. It's a movement. It's an action. So hip hop, when Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel, who I just saw Melly Mel at the gym last week too. That's my guy. Mm-hmm. When they put out the message, that's hip hop. If you listen to the words in the message, they're talking about, okay, yeah. we're, in the, we're in the gutter, we're in the hood, we know what they did. Talking about the establishment they have us here, but it's up to us not to kill each other, rob each other, you know, uh, rape the women or whatever. It's up to us not to behave like the animals that they intended us to be. Yeah. So we're hip to that game plan and we're going to move in a different direction. That's what hip hop means. It's a meaning. A lot of people don't know that. And it became a culture. But what's happened is once um, these artists started getting money thrown at them, the definition in the culture got compromised. And if you want to pinpoint anything, although NWA was sending a message saying, "You look, us black kids, we getting beat up in the street. Cops is fucking with us. You know, Rodney King and all that stuff. We understand you're angry, but they were also making millions of dollars. All right. So instead of on top of spreading the message about police brutality and bloods and crips and gangs in L.A., something that I did not know anything about us saying in the wet East Coast, we didn't know about 
running through backyards, has cops chasing you with, with the helicopters. We've mm, never seen anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, we've never seen anything like that. And it was like, what's going on over there with the brothers over there? That overshadowed um, what Karabas One was doing, what Public Enemy was doing, um, X Clan that overshadowed because we was promoting hip hop, knowledge of self, not kill Whitey, not blame Whitey. Understand systematic racism is a real thing. Racism is a real thing, but how are you going to move? It's not yeah. going away. How are you going to move? You got to move accordingly. <laughs> we we promoted self awareness. Knowledge of self, um, not to use racism as an excuse, as a crutch to uh, uh, prohibit you from going anywhere in life. It's a hurdle. All you right? get over it. Right. You got to get over it. And yeah. how do you get over it? Through community. Through community. And we have to sit down and do what the Chinese do, what the Latins do, what, 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 what the Jewish people do, what all of them do. We have to do what they do. And um, also, if you guys are channel members, you could watch this full recording between Kofa and myself with Drew Titan in its entirety. It's in the membership only. So become a tradition breaker. I want to give a shout out to all the new tradition breakers. Also, I want to give a shout out to Blaze for gifting five memberships. That means a lot to me. That means the world to me. All right, man. I appreciate y'all.